Will you stay here? Is this okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, everybody, now we'll start again. Afternoon session. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jason Thompson. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jason Thompson, author of magisterial works. Room on that table. Jason will speak. Jason will speak this afternoon on Robert Hay and Edward William Lane. The rewards and frustrations of friendship. Oh, thank you, Eric. My pleasure. <laughs> a, a good way to learn about people is to study the people around them. That's why collective biography or prosopography is an excellent approach to apply to Robert Hay. We've heard about some of Hay's chums over the past couple of days, and another was his lifelong friend. Edward William Lane, with whom he shared many adventures, misadventures, and a number of closely held secrets. Lane uh, was born in 1801, so he was two years younger than Robert Hay and a near contemporary. He was raised by his mother, his widowed mother, who ran a school and apparently received a, a very good early education, albeit a naive one, because when he went up to Cambridge intending to follow his father's career as a clergyman, he was so appalled by what he considered the degenerate lifestyle of the undergraduates <laughs> there that he left that den of vice and sin after just two days and swore never to return. Instead, he decided to become an artist. Now, it's important to explain the, the Lanes were an artistic family through several generations following their uncle, the artist Gainsborough. And Lane's brother, Richard J. Lane, A-R-A, who, uh, uh, who made all of the portraits of Lane that we will see, was a highly accomplished artist himself. But, and so Lane is apprenticed as an as a engraver, scratching his burin into, into metal plates. That turned out not to be his career. He only published one print because his interests were attracted elsewhere by the uh, uh, sensational book by uh, the strongman Egyptologist Giovanni Battista Belzoni and Belzoni's uh, famous exhibit of the tomb of Seti I that he had discovered at Piccadilly near where Lane was scratching his metal plates. And Lane decided the Middle East his career to go to Egypt and study everything he could about it. Now, at some point, his interest focused more, but not entirely, on modern Egypt. As he explained, a zealous attachment to the study of oriental literature and a particular desire to re render myself familiar with the language of the Arabs and with their manners and customs induced me to visit Egypt. But these were not my only reasons. I had long held a fervent desire to examine the antiquities of that most interesting country. And he goes on to explain how he intended to write a book about it today, an illustrated book. And for that reason, we've seen the camera lucida already. Lane was well acquainted with its inventor, Dr. Wollaston, and that's what he made all, all of his images in on camera lucida cards. We'll see a lot of them in this hour. Some of them rough outlines, and some of them he's touched up with sepia and all intending them for publication. He studied hard, so hard that his health broke as he, and somehow he learned enough Egyptian colloquial Arabic to function in Egypt before he arrived at Alexandria in September, 1825. But when his boat approached shore, he was seized by an anxiety attack. What am I gonna do, he thought, after all that hard work and study, if I don't like this place after all? 
And so that prompted him to write some of the best lines he ever composed. He said, as, as I approached the shore, I felt like an Eastern bridegroom about to lift up the veil of his bride and to see for the first time the features which were to charm or disappoint or disgust him. I was not visiting Egypt merely as a traveler to examine its pyramids and temples and grottos. And after satisfying my curiosity to quit it for other pl places and other pleasures, I was about to throw myself entirely among natives to learn their language, their customs and their dress. And in prosecuting the study of their literature to associate almost exclusively with, with natives. He need not have worried. He landed in Alexandria, quickly saw all of the usual sites. The two of us still had not yet migrated to London and New York, but he quickly moved on upstream. Now, a little note, as he drew this, this image of Fuwa on the Western Rosetta branch of the Nile, you can see his eye for detail. But one thing I want to point out from the front, if you can see him, on, that's Lane on the, on, the, on the right. He usually, whenever he could, would draw himself into his images. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and sometimes uh, Robert Hay as well. And so he landed at Bulak. There's Sinan Pasha just in behind where the 26th July uh, bridge is today and reached Cairo, which in those days was uh, a mile inland as he made his, his view stretching from the south. There's the frumpy old Bab al-Hadid that was in And then moved off uh, the citadel uh, with, without the distinctive Muhammad Ali mosque. Lane lived uh, right, right, right there. Todd, you can't hear me? Difficult when you face away. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to point to it. Ramsey Square is right there on the on the left now. Uh, he made good on his vow to throw himself almost exclusively among among the natives, adopting well not Egyptian but Turkish lifestyle, and also a new identity. He transformed himself, as you see in one of his letters, Mansur Effendi, or. Mansur Effendi al Inglisi, because he never pretended, like uh, some travelers, to be something he was not. He was an Englishman living in Egypt, learning about Egypt, and was treated as such. But the Turkish status gave him a little bit of extra cachet. And you can also, in, you can see him in this stunning life size terracotta statue made by his brother, Richard. And a, a key to his identity on the, uh, on the little finger of his right hand, here we'll make it clearer, little right hand, the finger of his right hand, <clears throat> where he always wore to the end of his life, his signet ring engraved with his Mansour Effendi identity. So I, while I was in Egypt, I had to, in the invitation, I had to have one made as well, but with, with my Egyptian name instead of, instead of his. He plunged into all of the, into Cairo. There he is perched on the mastaba of the Ahwa, or coffee house, again, trying to impart as much information as he could. You can see them making coffee in the background, the sakiyas or water carriers, the camels with their accoutrements, and the model for the donkey is his own donkey, um, Dum Dum. Uh, the stories I could tell about that burro. He uh, prayed in the mosque. He never converted, uh, although he did become a bit heterodox with time. That's laying there on the right and, and, and back to, to learn the positions of prayer and uh, to delve as deeply into Islam as he could and out into Cairo, Al-Azhar, and to see all of the Islamic monuments. And later he toured all of these on the sketching tour with Robert Hay. Or out to uh, the Northern Cemetery, to that jewel of a monument, the Mosque and Mussolini, a Sultan Kite Bay, particularly dear to my heart 
because when I'm in Cairo, I live just behind that in the Northern Cemetery in my adopted family's uh, building. He also, of course, made it out to, out to the pyramids. And there in front <clears throat> were, well, the, the village of Neslet, as the man has ruined it now, he lived in one of those, those tombs in the cliff. And he said, never did I have a more happy time. And so the pyramids from top to bottom can only show you a sample at the cross. And here at the third pyramid, just beyond the gouge made by Uthman, he is standing there above the, the row of, of granite stones. It had not yet been opened, but he predicted that it would appear there uh, to, to the, be found there to the right. He was not interested in excavation and he had no money to do it. His, his goals were language and society. And in the Eastern and Western cemeteries, he delved extensively a floor plan of one of the mastabas and also began recording cartouches to put together his king list. Their fourth dynasty, Shepses Kaf, Khufu, another name for Khufu, and fifth, uh, fifth dynasty, Neferir Kare Kakai. Uh, at Sa'ara, he, uh, he explored thoroughly. I don't have an image of it to share with you today, but he was the first to map the hypogea or underground of the Steppe Pyramid, which is greater than that of any other pyramid. And no uh, of a 26th dynasty of Pharaoh. And he made the, uh, the obligatory trip uh, up, up the Nile as far as the second cataract and, and Wadi Halfa, recording all the way. But we'll go into that in a moment. When he returned to Cairo in early 1827, he was working on his notes and pictures and preparing his books, when who should appear but Robert Hay by prearrangement of a friend because, who came to stay with him uh, along with his traveling companion, a former Greek slave named uh, Kalitsa, who was about 13 years old at the time. They all hit it off very, very well. Now, I don't have an early image of Kalitsa, but she's almost certainly one of the, one of the uh, girls there on the left in this image from the Hay portfolio where Hay uh, portrayed himself in, in a room uh, in temple at Medina at Habu that they converted into such a comfortable habitation. Um, the Hay on the right, and I don't, we, we've had various identifications for the other two gentlemen, and perhaps someone can supply their own, their own opinion. Now, it's very important here to stop. And, and point out, Hay and Lane were all part of an informal group of young Orientalists and Egyptologists, a word that did not even yet exist. And notable among the group was John Gardner Wilkinson after he had metamorphosized himself into Sir Gardner Wilkinson. He was Ismail Afindi. They both, Wilkinson and Lane, both died almost uh, at the same time. But till the end of their life in the 1870s, they called each other Ismail and Mansour. Uh, James Burton, before he went to Egypt, Yakub Effendi. And our expert on Burton is our friend Neil Cook, who would love to be here today with us if he could. Joseph Bonomi, Yusuf Effendi, and others, uh, A.C. Harris, the, the merchant at Alexandria, and his daughter, Salima. Yeah, Harris was an excellent Egyptologist and also the consul general, uh, Henry, Henry <coughs> Saul. And so now off, off upriver um, on their Diabiya, no, that's actually a Kanjia, but Diabetes are just a little bit larger. And uh, with its cabin, that's actually Lane on, on the right, and uh, that made such an excellent traveling office for, for a traveler in those, in those days. Um, so going up river, Lane made hundreds of camera lucid cards. We can only show a few, such as when they stopped at Gebeleter, where again, you see Lane imparting as much information as he possibly could. 
uh, clothing, musical instruments, water raising devices, the dahabiyya, complete with the detail of the smoke from the kitchen that was also located in front. And just to show a few, at, at Beni Hassan, the tomb of Bucket III, there's either Lane or Hay uh, inside portraying themselves. Um, one of the interesting things in following these travelers is the opportunity to see things as they saw them and to know things as they knew them. Lots of changes. Here at Stela A, at Amorna, uh, it's a, a bit difficult to appreciate it as it once was. You see Angela and I there, most of what we see is our reflection in the afternoon, in the afternoon sun. But Lane, and that's Lane R. Hay staring in wild surmise saying, what in the world is that? You know, we've just never seen any kind of representation like that at all. And uh, who are these people? And the blank cartouches, of course, give no indication. Now, on the other side of the river, in the northern tombs with, that Wilkinson had discovered a short time before, but Wilkinson tried to keep them secret from the rest, which put Hay into an absolutely incoherent rage because that wasn't the, the way that things done. But Wilkinson tended to play his own cards rather closely. And in, the, in tomb three, the tomb of Ahmes, he again found the same extraordinary representations but all images had been defaced. So he ran around copying bits and pieces and putting them together and assembled two complete sets, which only increased his confusion because of course, the one on the left in one of those remarkable Amarna innovations is actually the Aten, uh, the, Aten the, the deity of the life-giving uh, 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 sun. And, and the one on the right, uh, the pair on the right is Akhenaten himself, uh, who had been so thoroughly erased from memory. And these people are kicking themselves. Why don't we know what, the, what this is? When in fact, they were privileged, privileged to see something that, uh, that was really quite new, an important rediscovery. And of course, on to Thebes and there, uh, and naturally, they spent time at the major temples. I'm not point out, not to show family photos, but I think it's important to note that when you're researching and traveling and following these guys, you're always conditioned by by family experiences. And so there's there's my little boy Julian on the right making his own perspective of of the temple. And I had a, always had a hard time keeping pencil and paper for for my own use because he was ripping them off uh, uh, as fast as he could. So there it is, or as it was a few years ago. But look at what Lane was able to see, both, both uh, obelisk in place and the Egyptian village that was so evocatively described by Lucy Duff Gordon spilling back into the temple. Or at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, at Mighty Karnak, he lived for a while uh, on the left-hand side of the uh, of the uh, northern pile of uh, northern pylon in, in a in a habitation couldn't quite stand up straight that Joseph Bonomi had made. But their main location was on the on the west bank and where they made their headquarters on the hill of Sheikh Abdul Gurna. I stick with this my old photograph that was taken before the Gurnawi were bulldozed bulldozed away. He is located, as, as Aidan pointed out before, in Theban tomb 83, there, there in, the, in the right middle, also known as Wilkinson's house. And we can see it in this illustration up at the top by uh, uh, Alexander Hen Henry Rhine, as Wilkinson has made it into a little fort with rooms, pigeon towers, uh, a nice kitchen, and a, and a beautiful a beautiful veranda. Uh, it served as, as sort of the Gurna guest house for about 70 years. 
I published something about it in Kemet. I guess it must have been 30 years ago, describing how its, its evolution on time over time from creation to uh, destruction. As we've seen before, the beautiful veranda. And you can see the original tomb portals there. And Kalitsa is standing in one right there. That was always the bedroom that over. And she is standing right there. Sometimes it, it's, it all seems like it must have been a dream from the Arabian Nights. So fully has it all been gone. This is great quarters, just a short walk down the hill to the, to the, to the Ramesseum. Or you could go a, a bit north, a short, slightly longer walk uh, to Medina Habu. But Lane was not able to buy his ticket and walk in because the, the monument was in a somewhat, somewhat different state. And those are, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and the temples of uh, Hatshepsut in the so-called Monastery of the North, Der al-Bahari, which looks something like uh, out of Frank Lloyd Wright. And it's much cleaner and clearer now than when I took this snap a few years ago. But this is what Lane and Hay saw. That's Der al-Bahari as it was then. And so they would tend to lurk down there in the middle where there was a, a, a part that, that was accessible to them. But again, they wondered, well, what exactly is this? Why do these royal titles have feminine endings? Is it possible there was a woman king, as indeed there was with uh, Hatshepsut? And although her memory had been a face, Lane was able to put her, at least in the right place uh, in the king list. Uh, or you could walk over the hill or take the long way around, stop off at KV1, uh, Julian making his, his recording there. And that one, until fairly recently, had not, had not changed much, but there's been some renovation uh, since then. Uh, oh, and KV11 that we've seen before, this is one of his outline sketches uh, that he did not intend to work up for publication. But he's noted some important things, such as the unique hot whore headed uh, columns uh, near, the, near the entrance. Um, and when they were there, Hay, Kalitsa, and Lane would make their habitations in the entrances of, of these tombs, quite, quite comfortable. Guns, spears, carpets, all of that. And in every one of these depictions, and there are a number of them in the hay portfolio, which is where this comes from, this big old dog is always asleep in the front. And I would so much wish that I knew more about that hound because he, she was part of the process as well. Up well, further north, skip over so much. At Armand, Lane was one of the last to see the surviving above ground uh, parts of the temple of the war god Montu. And we can Photoshop this and get some idea of, of the, uh, how he worked with the camera lucida. Any experience at all with these kind of images, you'll recognize the camera loosened almost immediately. Uh, Lane's brother, Richard, made a portrait of him, sketch, striding through the monuments of ancient Egypt. At, <clears throat> excuse me, at further south still, at this, uh, and we find them here. There have been some changes here, haven't there? Quite a few. When, uh, when Lane was there, it was necessary for him uh, to go actually on top of the temple and then descend uh, through a hole in the floor to get through a few feet of available space uh, right at the top. And through the first cataract and on into Nubia at Tafa, where he uh, also took care to document contemporary Nubians and their household as well. When they returned to Cairo, Lane was working up his books and all 
preparing to uh, return to Britain because the money had run out when something new entered his life. This is often identified as Nafisa. It is not, it's just a portrait of a young Egyptian woman, totally imaginary by Richard Lane. Nafisa was five years old at, at the time. But one dark evening near dusk, he walked through the common uh, slave market and he saw this poor child all alone and miserable. And he, he felt so sorry for her, but he couldn't afford her. But Robert Hay bought her and placed Nefisa in his care. When they departed Egypt, uh, Lane and Nefisa, Lane took Nefisa home with him, and so did Hay and Kalitsa. They traveled together and spent the obligatory month of quarantine at Malta in the Lazaretto. And while they were there, they discussed their future plans. Lane was going to be a professional writer, a man of letters. Hay was preparing to return to Egypt with an even bigger and better team. And Lane offered to, well, you know, if I can help you from time to time in England, I'll certainly be happy to. Um, now, Lane, when he returned to London, he worked assiduously as a writer every day, counting his words or rather his pages and keeping track of his progress and working through, working through uh, several drafts of his book manuscript entitled Description of Egypt. And when he had about the third draft ready, he took it to the famous firm of John Murray and Albemarle Street, the best place for works of travel and exploration. And there in the famous drawing room where Lord Byron, shadowy in the back, had uh, dealt with Murray. Uh, so Lane pitched his book to John Murray II, who was quite impressed and agreed to publish the book with all its illustrations the more the better, he thought. There was one catch though. There was a section of the book about the manners and customs, <clears throat> manners and customs of the modern Egyptians. Murray II did not think it fit and insisted that it, that it be removed. Other, otherwise, Lane proceeded to make the fair and final draft. He went through four drafts altogether of description of Egypt. And here is a page of his fair copy, the chapter <clears throat> at Wadi, Wadi es Sabua. And his clear handwriting is so, is so beautiful. It, it was a great relief after working with the execrable handwriting of Gardner Wilkins. And now I'm having to deal with Sir Richard Burton's bad handwriting, which is so bad that I'm pretty sure it can cause brain damage. The, uh, he, he worked up a dozen maps, such as this one of, uh, of Thebes. So you can see Medina Habu on the top, Valley of the Kings uh, off behind, and the major monuments uh, on, on the East Bank, and uh, produced uh, his, fine, his fine finished illustrations, which were intended to be finer still, as they were to be worked up by lithography. Altogether, uh, description of Egypt has over 100 illustrations. Uh, alas, the Reform Bill of 1832 pre presented a big political and social crisis. Everything, including publication, came to a stop. And he was so eager for his book to, to go to press and, and nothing can, could be done. So he sank into, into depression thinking, oh, I was so happy in Egypt. If I could just get back to Egypt, everything would be fine. Then he, he didn't have any money, but he remembered those chapters about the modern Egyptians. So he took them to one of those remarkable Victorian voluntary associations this one called the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, which specialized in the publication of, well, useful knowledge, but also to be broadcast to all classes of society, including the lower industrial orders, so that they too could be improved. And so with the three or 400 pounds that he 
that he made in advance from modern Egyptians, he uh, went off to Cairo for his second trip. And here Richard depicted him somewhat more mature, a beard uh, uh, appropriate for a married man, but always the Mansur Effendi signet ring uh, on, his, uh, on, on his name. Uh, there, he had a number of adventures during the second trip, uh, but we don't have time to go into them here. Now, the composition of modern Egyptians also reveals something about the mores of 19th century society. In those days, it was proper in scholarly literature when writing about, say, intimate physical things, sexual things, whatever, to cloak them discreetly in Latin <laughs> and then demote them as footnotes, as Lane has done here in his, in his treatment of the circumcisioni puellarum, and here rasurum about, about shaving uh, uh, bodily parts, or further down post concubitum to, to stick with uh, Latin. And the result was the, the, the society couldn't handle it. I said, no, that's how it's done for the scholarly classes, but we're trying to reach the lower classes as well. And never mind that they can't read Latin, they might speculate on, on it and thereby suffer moral corruption. So all of that was taken out with a considerable loss of ethnographic materials. But at least the world was saved from moral corruption <laughs> <laughs> until a few years ago <laughs> because I went through the manuscripts, collected them all, and then in Cairo, an elderly Jesuit priest, a Dominican brother from the monastery at the Gala, and I translated them all and published them. So any moral deterioration noticed for decades, this may well be the cause. <laughs> Manor, an account of the manners and customs of the modern Egyptians became a classic a source for not just modern Egypt, but the entire Middle East, medieval Egypt, and occasionally Egyptologists have, have, have consulted it. It was a great success, never, <clears throat> never went out of print. Now with that, he ran back to John Murray and said, yeah. and we published description of Egypt now, but there had been some changes while he was in Egypt. John Murray II had been succeeded by John Murray III, and he wanted to show dad how publishing should really be done. Meanwhile, Wilkinson appeared with his book, Manners and Customs of the Ancient Egyptians. So he decided, well, we can't publish two big illustrated books. So he took Wilkinson's book and told Lane to find another publisher. He never was able and as a to do it. But look at what he accomplished in modern Egyptians, taking people into Egyptians' home lanes, washing his hands there, showing the, the methods of dining and, and, and so forth. Uh, a picture of Egyptian life from childhood to, to, to death. Uh, the, uh, the, the meaning of, of it all was that and Wilkinson had basically displaced him. Now, I'm not, I don't have documentary proof that Wilkinson knew that Lane's book was at Murray's, but it's hard to see how he, how he, did, not, how he did not know it. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we eventually were able to publish a description of Egypt in, in, in 2000. Publication can be a long drawn out process, but 170 years would seem to be overdoing it. His next project was a translation of the Arabian Nights, uh, which uh, he valued not so much for the stories, not so much for the tales, but for the opportunity to annotate. And that consumed four years of his life. Every month he had to produce another chapter because 
unfortunately, he didn't. He he didn't. He worked in a story by story format instead of night by night, and so you lose that bit of uh, you know Shahrazad's uh, life hanging by a thread every morning. And the king said, "Well, wait, I'll hear another. I'll hear more of this. But, you know, we'll, we'll kill her. We'll kill her the next day." And uh, with its with its remarkable wood engraved illustrations, none of them though by Lane. That was the publisher's idea. And in fact, Lane considered them to be irrelevant. He went on to produce uh, selections from the Quran, which is utterly insignificant book. Arabian Nights has retained its longevity. I mean, in the 1880s, it was overshadowed by Sir Richard Burton's famous translation, but even today, it, it, has, it, it has its followers. It is, of course, heavily expurgated, but it cannot be completely expurgated. Otherwise, you lose the original framing tale, which is the carousing of the queen's wives and the king's determination to do something about them. I'm pretty sure he just wrote this for money uh, because he's at midlife now. And, and there were other things going on too. I mean, <clears throat> this is a page from the Pascal Coast portfolio that Robert Hay purchased and intended to publish. Now, let me explain. From 1828, when he returned to England until 1841, when he uh, uh, finished the Arabian Nights, he virtually served as Hay's literary and business agent. Uh, he, he offered to be of help. Now, Lane is sometimes said that Lane was Hay's employee. He never, he never was. He did all of this out of friendship, but before long, he found himself hiring and firing artists, solving problems between Hay, who often did not, well, any, anytime three people are involved, there's problems in communication, shipping materials and all of that. Finally, he complained, hey, I can't do it anymore. I need, I need more time for my own writing. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to make it as a writer. And, but then he would feel bad about it and say, oh, okay, please send me something else to do. You know, use, use, me, use me further. Uh, but hey, Lane believed in hey. He had seen these things go together, the collection, the cast, um, uh, so, so many other things that escaped me at the moment, but above all, the magnificent portfolio of, of drawings that he wanted to see come to fruition that of course only partially did. There Lane kept chiding him, you know, say, get, get on with it. Let, let's, let's just, just do it, you know, let, let's publish this. Lane uh, believed, in fact, Lane made it a point not even to think about ancient because he said, I find it so fascinating. It draws me away from my own, from my own work. Now, there was another issue with Hay, too. We'll use this for, for Nafisa. This is 1840-41 now. Nafisa was five when he acquired and brought her to England. They moved in with his mother and then later with his, his sister, Sophia Poole, whose husband, Reverend Poole, had vanished into the, into the night somewhere. But now in 1840-41, Nafisa was 18 years old. And so you have an unmarried adult woman and an unmarried adult man living in the same house, not terribly proper in those days. And so Robert Hay essentially threatened to repossess her. <laughs> it, 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 if, the, if this continues, if you don't want her, send her back. And so Nafisa and Lane consulted his mother, and she decreed that they should marry. And so they did. And there was a beginning of a good marriage. It lasted, it lasted well. They were very companionate. She didn't really uh, join in his work or anything like that. Their only sadness was that Nafisa was never able to carry a child to term. So they consulted Dr., if that's what he was, 
Henry Abbott of collection and papyrus fame. He diagnosed her condition as ovarian dropsy, a very, very serious condition indeed. But he said there was an operation that could cure it. However, it was invariably fatal. In other words, the operation was a su success, but the patient died. It, it, they decided not to have, have the operation. Here, Lane, well, a married man, what am I to do? How am I to support my family? And at that point, enter Lord Prito, now the fourth Duke of Northumberland, whom we might note, the, the expert there is our afflicted friend, John Ruffle, whom we would very much wish could be with us today. Um, Lord Prudhoe and his, uh, his sidekick, Major Felix, traveled around uh, Egypt at about the same time as Lane and the rest of the gang. And now as the fourth Duke of Northumberland and a very wealthy man, he offered to support Lane in the preparation of an air dictionary. This was the fulfillment of everything Lane could have wanted, to plunge into the sea of Arabic language and never come up. So with that, he uh, went to Egypt for his fourth, third trip, excuse me. It lasted several years, seven years, but it is the least well-documented of them all because Lane spent all of his time working on, on Arabic with his language master, Sheikh Ed Dasuki. He only took off Fridays when it was possible to visit him. And uh, also he observed Sunday and did not work on that. So I knew Lane lived in the Souk al Khawadis and the street is still there with the houses. So naturally I went over there only to find that his house had been zapped by the Northeast uh, enclosure of the Abdeen Palace. But he left a remarkable floor plan of the house at the bottom. You can see Ned's table and Sheikh's table where he uh, worked on the Arabic English lexicon. Uh, Returning to England in 1849, he eventually settled in Worthing at one Union place, uh, a very quiet place to work. At least it was then. It's, uh, it's changed somewhat now. That's, that's, one, that's the post office, and so it's been obliterated. But Wor Worthing is still a, a quiet place and a very good place to compose an Arabic English lexicon if you're so inclined. And he's working there all of some of these very precious Arabic uh, Arabic dictionaries from medieval times on as he compiled as he compiled the dictionary. And there the first page of the first draft of the Arabic English lexicon can't see any of the details but there it is. And not only was his English handwriting clear, he wrote a remarkably clear, never calligraphic, but perfectly clear Arabic hand. And the, in the early draft, he called it the Arabic English thesaurus, but you can faintly see where he's collected, corrected thesaurus to lexicon. And in 1863, appeared the first volume of the Arabic English lexicon to be followed by the successive volumes at intervals. Uh, 1863 was also a fairly important year in Hay's life, wasn't it? Yes, that, that was, it, it died much, much too soon. Here he is, I th supposedly in 18, in 1860, three years bef before his, before his, his early death. And Kalitsa, you know, I often look at that portrait and try to, try to infer, infer something, but it, it's far, far, oh, far away. But they, they kept up with each other. In fact, the only real surviving series of Lane's letters 
are those that he wrote to Hay and told it all. They, they held nothing back. They, they knew everything about each other and all, all, of, all of their secrets. Lane letters are extremely rare because he didn't write many. And toward the end of his life, he had every one that he could rounded up and he burned them all. And so Lane was getting on in years too. He, uh, 18, this portrait was taken in 1875, the year before his death, still got his signet ring as, as always. And Nafisa was getting on in years too. This is the only authentic uh, image of her that I know about. But in 1860, 1876, the East Norwood Cemetery beckoned. And Lane's out there somewhere. I don't know exactly where, because about 40 or 50 years ago, the local government smashed his and Nafisa's uh, monuments and took, took them away. It's interesting to note though, if backing up to here, after Hay died, Kalitsa commissioned Joseph Bonomi to decide to design a monument in Egyptian style uh, for her late husband. Unfortunately, it was never, never realized. But even as he worked away so assiduously on his lexicon, at Worthing, he only took one day off a week. At there he worked every day, including Friday, from early morning until 10 at night, desperately trying to complete the Arabic English lexicon, which he never quite did, but he, he did enough. And uh, uh, the only day he took off was Sunday when he relaxed by studying Hebrew. <laughs> but, you know, surely during those days, occasionally he would take a walk, stop, and think occasionally. He must have remembered the old Mansour Effendi days and his old friend Robert Hay and all the effort he had put into trying to make Hay's dream come to fruition, only to see very little to come of it except good, sincere friendship, and maybe that's enough.